thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. I'm so excited to be able to talk to you today. Um, I purposefully wrote this lecture just a tad short to hopefully be able to have uh, a lot of time at the end to, uh, for discussion and for, and for questions. Uh, but today I really do want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, minor strokes. So the small strokes that people have where they look pretty good and you think they're doing really well. And some of those problems that they have, particularly with cognition and how we can use tools like MEG to really understand and potentially to identify uh, um, areas where treatment might be effective uh, in these individuals to really help improve their, their quality of life. Uh, just as far as disclosures, you know, I'm very lucky. My lab is, is supported in part uh, by grants through the American Heart Association and through the NIH, as well as uh, through a very generous uh, patient family philanthropic gift. So today I wanna kind of get us all on the same page and talk for just a little bit. I know many of you have, have a background in stroke and, and, and know a lot of this already, but get us on the same page about you know, how far we've come with stroke, but how the landscape has really changed and how rather than these huge strokes that put a lot of patients in nursing homes, now a lot more individuals are having smaller strokes and what that may mean as far as thinking about their recovery and some of the issues that they're having. Um, uh, with, with cognition and with, and with other processing. Um, I want to then specifically focus on cognitive dysfunction and talk about kind of how in the past we viewed uh, post-stroke dementia and thought about it and how maybe we need to change that view a little bit uh, and how tools like MEG, like I was saying, may be able to give us some insight into why small strokes can really result in big global cognitive problems and how that may give us insights into treatment. But then also at the end, we'll talk about how, even though I think stroke is really special, uh, this also may give us uh, some insight into how other disorders that have tiny little lesions like multiple sclerosis may benefit from some of this knowledge. So let's all get on the same page about the impact of ischemic disease. So I don't have to tell any of you all that the reason I have a job is because stroke is really common and debilitating, right? There's nearly 800,000 cases annually in the United States, and it really is one, if not the leading cause of long-term morbidity. Even though we've improved with being now the fifth leading cause of death, people are having strokes and they're needing to recover. And this is resulting in a lot of healthcare expenditures, lost wages, and people being at home when they should be back in, in society back at work. And, and our goal is, as, or my goal is, as a stroke neurologist is really to help to get them there. Uh, and, what, and why is stroke so common? Well, because our population is aging. We're doing a better job taking care of folks, but that does mean that uh, as they get older, hypertension, diabetes, atrial fibrillation, all of these risk factors are really, really common in our population and they're resulting in strokes. But I just want to pause for a moment and think about how, how the stroke landscape has really changed when we think about treatment. It wasn't too long ago where, unfortunately, there wasn't much we could do. When a patient would come in not being able to move one side and we'd say, wow, gosh, I'm so sorry. Looks like you're having a stroke. We're going to admit you. And then we'd focus on, on stabilizing and on then moving toward recovery. But it wasn't really until the 50s that we even started to begin to think about the possibility of opening blood vessels. You know, the first true endorectomy was probably, there's a little bit of controversy surrounding, but performed by DeBakey in, in early 1950s. Uh, and, and we've kind of been, been on, a, on a path toward improving treatment ever since. Uh, but it took till 1995 to really see major, major changes. And that was when everything changed. Uh, most stroke neurologists say they remember exactly where they were when the NINDS trial came out and showed that when you give patients that are having an acute stroke, tissue plasminogen activator or TPA, which is really like a, a clot buster. So when you think about your kitchen sink and, and how it gets a clog in it and you pour in Drano, that's kind of what TPA does. It dissolves clots and it opens up those blood vessels. And when it was a, uh, shown to be effective for acute stroke treatment in 1995, and then FDA approved very quickly thereafter and became used in the general population, wow, did we see a humongous impact in our ability to not just rehabilitate individuals with stroke, but to treat them so that they were having smaller strokes and doing better and their outcomes were better. But then it got even better, although it took another 20 years. And we learned from the cardiologists and we learned that in a group of patients with big vessels that were occluded, if you actually snaked a catheter all the way up and all the way into the brain and mechanically yanked that clot out, 
you were able to, to improve outcomes even further. I know probably a lot of you are, are familiar with this uh, rank and shift where we, we have a control group that, that has a scale and, and this is the good end where we want to be and the bad end where we don't want to be. And we see that with intervention, with this thrombectomy, uh, outcomes were shifted. So we had more good outcomes. We made a huge difference. So wow, stroke has come a long way. And what's that resulted in? Why am I here today? Why am I going to talk to you about minor stroke? Well, that took these huge lesions, right? This is a diffusion weighted sequence. So a brain MRI and this white is the stroke. White is bad. This person has aphasia. This person can't move their right side. This person is going to a nursing home and I don't know if they're going to leave. Um, and we took, we, we take these big humongous strokes and turn them into much smaller strokes where maybe they have a little bit of weakness, or maybe they have some of these other problems that I tell you about, but their overall recovery, we could all agree is much, much better. That's terrific. At the same time though, we're, we're, we're making advancements in both speech and motor function as far as rehabilitation. And I'll just give you a couple of examples that are exciting from Hopkins. You know, John Krakauer has been working uh, on motor recovery in his BLAM lab and using a dolphin model to really help with upper extremity uh, rehabilitation in patients after stroke and making huge strides. And, and RG Hillis has been working on TDS or TDCS for aphasia and again, uh, uh, improving outcomes from the recovery standpoint. So very exciting. And then there's always the promise, right, of neuroprotection. People are working really hard to figure out if there's agents that actually can protect the brain when someone starts to have a stroke, so less tissues damaged, and what that right time window is. And we don't quite have that yet, but boy, people are hoping that, that eventually we're going to get there. So all of these things are really exciting. They're all coming together. Better treatments acutely, better rehabilitation, maybe some protection. We're really trying to turn these debilitating strokes into much smaller lesions. So I haven't mentioned much yet about post-stroke cognitive dysfunction. Where do we stand with this and how does this all relate? Well, I think the next thing that we all have to do is think for a moment about how we measure how people are doing after a stroke and how we think in terms of reporting outcomes, because that's going to put this all in perspective for the rest of the talk as we talk about how people do. And the traditional recovery metrics that we use currently is the NIH stroke scale. So that's, for those of you who aren't familiar, a measure of stroke severity. You get points for things you can't do. If you can't lift your arm, you get four points. If you can't look all the way to both sides, you get points. If you can't talk, you get points. Points are bad. And the more points you have, the more severe your stroke and pr probably the worst that you're going to do. It's really commonly used acutely when patients come into the hospital to, to, so that when you say to me, this person has an NIH stroke scale of 20, I'm thinking, wow, big stroke. And then later on to talk about how they're doing in the outpatient setting. This person still has an NIH stroke scale of 16. Oh, they probably don't look so good, right? As opposed to they have an NIH stroke scale of two. They're pretty moving around pretty well, maybe just a little bit of weakness on one side. So it lets us to get a, a picture of overall severity. What you notice though, is that it's, uh, there's a couple of problems. The NIH stroke scale doesn't do much. I didn't mention cognition in here, did I? There's level of consciousness, so are they awake? There's, can they answer some questions? But it doesn't get more granular than that. So there's a lot that we're not describing by using metrics like these, particularly when we think about things like cognition and processing. The other uh, traditional recovery metric that we talk about so much when we think about outcomes and is really good when we think about those big strokes, right? And in fact, I showed you the rank and shift. Well, that's based on the rank and score. It's a zero to six. So zero means you're completely deficit free, no symptoms versus six means you're dead. Probably not ideal, right? But then the rest of it is based on your functional ability with a big uh, focus on walking. If you're able to ambulate, that's kind of where the, the shift is and, 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 um, and where it turns. But what you notice is this is very heavily motor-based because uh, that's very important for us being able to be independent and doing functional activities. Uh, and it's also very granular. So nowhere here are we talking about um, uh, the ability to, to think and to do higher level cognitive functioning. But it's great when you think about, like I was saying, those individuals that would come in couldn't move at all in a nursing home. Right, because it's very clear where they where they are on this uh, on this scale versus somebody who's doing better. So it's great for big strokes, but not as good when we describe these smaller strokes who probably have less problems 
and, and I'm going to tell you they do. And it's hard to capture that in some of these. So that's what we're up against so far. Um, and, and with what I'm going to tell you the rest of today, I hope I can kind of paint you that picture. And now we should probably get on the same page about how we used to think, and this is evolving, and I'll show you how, about kind of post-stroke uh, dementia and, and post-stroke cognitive decline. And, and the teaching was always right that there's Alzheimer's disease where people get worse. And then there's a vascular dementia, right? Where people have a stroke and their cognition goes down and they have another stroke and their cognition goes down. And it's this step, right? We learn on the boards as, 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 as doctors, this stepwise decline due to stroke after stroke after stroke. And if you look at post-stroke uh, cognitive decline in that way with this model and uh, the prevalence is anywhere from 7.4 to 40% based on the study. Wow, what a broad range. You have a stroke and later on at varying time points that you look, right, by one year, there's a very broad spread of, of, of how many people have problems with processing. I'll give you some examples of that and why that might be the case. So in, uh, in 1982, uh, the Framingham study looked at 212 dementia-free patients who had uh, their first ever stroke and it compared them to a thousand age and sex matched controls. And they followed them over time and they adjudicated them using a panel and nearly 20% developed dementia in the 10 years after their stroke versus only about 11%, so half of the control population. So they showed that much more common for, for a stroke to result in cognitive decline um, over that 10 year period. So that's one way that it's been reported. Another study has, has taken a look and they used the MOCA, which I'll tell you about in a minute, and, and a mini mental status screen to look at cognitive impairment over the first couple of months and found that rates were as high as 47%. This one here broke it down a little bit differently and tried to go, is it mild cognitive impairment or vascular dementia? So the issue is, is that these rates that are being reported are somewhat uh, variable because they're not being measured in quite the same way at quite the same time. So what the first thing that we wanted to do, um, because I follow a large group of patients after they're in the hospital, they come and see me, all of our uh, hospitalized patients at Johns Hopkins Bayview at our comprehensive stroke center are given an appointment about a month, anywhere from four to eight weeks after their stroke to come see us in clinic. And we follow these individuals one, six and at 12 months post-stroke. Uh, and that really allows us not only to take really good care of people throughout the course of their recovery as their needs change and their risk factors continue to be modified, but also to really observe what happens uh, in all phases of their recovery. And we become very interested in their cognition. So what we said is, well, okay, there's this model. What, what happens with our population? Where do they stand? So we took 214 of our patients that came to us uh, a couple of weeks after their ischemic stroke, so not hemorrhages, they, they had ischemia, they had a clot, and we compared them to 39 patients that didn't have control, that didn't have stroke. They had similar vascular risk factors because several of them had been admitted for TIA or for seizure or for other things. They were similar age, but they didn't have uh, uh, tissue disease, tissue damage on MRI. And we administered the MOCA, just a basic screen that I'll show you in a second. And what we did is we wanted to look at the effect uh, and how prevalent uh, cognitive impairment was compared to controls in those with severe strokes and those with more mild strokes. And this is the tool that we use, and a lot of you are probably very familiar with it, but I really like it. It's, it's uh, uh, for a couple of reasons. So this is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or the MOCA, and it allows you to, uh, to screen quickly and uh, reproduce uh, and with good reproducibility um, and break down into the different uh, places that patients have problems. Um, and to really look at cognition. So the uh, normal score on, on the MOCA for an adult population such as this is a 26 or better. Um, so less than 26 is typically thought of as a, at least a mild impairment. And some papers have shown that less than 19 is really considered severe. And we gave this to all of our patients. And the thing I like about it, the reason we use this over some other tools like the mini mental status exam is because a lot of our patients in clinic had very high function to begin with and minor strokes. And this ceiling effect is not quite as, uh, as much of a problem as in the mini mental status exam. So it really let us um, flesh out how people were doing. And what we found in our population was that 67% had at least mild impairment at, uh, uh, so a score of less than 26 at that one, one and a half months after their stroke. And 23%, nearly a quarter 
scored quite poorly. But what did that look like as far as how, how severe their strokes were? Well, not surprising, those with major strokes, so in black here, scored the worst of all. They scored uh, worse than those with minor strokes. So, right, major stroke, maybe a hemiparesis. Uh, most of our patients didn't have aphasia because they had to be able to cooperate. So it was either mild or not at all. Um, but they often had um, uh, dense hemiparesis or, or other more major problems, got a lot of points on the NIH stroke scale versus a minor stroke, where again, maybe somebody has a little bit of a, drip, uh, of, a, of a drift or a little bit of a facial droop versus no stroke. And when we looked at those with major stroke, they did the worst. Those with minor stroke though, still had significant deficits compared to those with no stroke at all. So even having a minor stroke, looking pretty good, being able to walk and talk, people were having significant difficulty with cognition. And this seemed to really be, remember how I told you the MOCA can break it down into different modalities uh, across all modalities, all, all cognitive domains, at least on this basic screen. So this was really interesting to us. It was a, a nice for us to look in our own population. The other thing that really hit home that we found that was really important is that when we looked at, at the effect of the MOCA and how associated it was with the modified Rankin follow-up, we actually found that it lower MOCA scores meant higher Rankin scores. So those who had poor cognition did worse functionally on their modified Rankin follow-up. So we demonstrated that cognition does play a big part in how functional you are. Right, So to be able to complete your ADLs and to be able to take your medicines so you do stay well and can move about and can complete your daily activities, uh, they're associated. So it shows the importance of cognitive dysfunction uh, in the outpatient setting. The other thing that we were able to, to look at uh, in this study was factors that predicted those who were going to have issues with cognition after their strokes. Who were those that were gonna have mild impairment, so a MOCA of less than 26, or more major uh, impairment with a MOCA of less than 19. And these, again, it's important to note, were patients that did not have dementia prior to their strokes. Many of them were quite high functioning. Um, not surprisingly, right, the worse their strokes were. So their NIH stroke scale, remember that severity scale being higher than six, so more severe, absolutely associated with both minor and more major deficits. Stroke volume, so the bigger the stroke, more than 17 cc's, much more likely to have a MOCA of less than 19. Uh, and those with left-sided lesions. Um, but what was interesting, and I think really important uh, to illustrate, is that employment prior to stroke also was protective against having a, um, a, a MOCA of less than 26. So baseline function matters. Those who were working prior to their stroke were less likely to have uh, significant cognitive problems following. And we've seen that not only in our objective uh, studies with the MOCA, but when we looked at patient reported outcomes as well, and that we had done that a couple of years prior, where we actually provided patients with the stroke impact scale and asked them how they were doing and, and to, and to self-report their outcomes uh, and, and found that actually those who had been working prior did, did had better functional outcomes. And this was in a, gr a group with minor strokes. So we took out those with aphasia and dense hemiparesis and looked at those with, with more minor symptoms. The other thing that looking at our own patient population did was it showed us that this model is just wrong, and that's not what we're seeing in our population in clinic, right? And, and others have recognized that as well, which is why they include in this figure a, a B, which I didn't put in to begin with, where in reality, when you have your stroke, uh, patients go down and have cognitive impairment, but then the trajectories are, very, are variable depending on the patient. And some patients will improve back up to their baseline. Some patients will improve a little bit. Some patients will continue to go down. And how do we reconcile who these different groups of patients are, right? And that's probably why this, another reason why this number is so different and has been anywhere from seven to 40%. And that's what we saw too. And interestingly, and, and as I set it up from the very beginning, right, I'm very interested in these individuals with these smaller strokes and less severe strokes, right, better outcomes. 
uh, lower NIH stroke scales. What are they reporting? Well, they were reporting different things to us than what we classically think about when we think about cognitive problems and memory, right? Everybody says cognitive memory must be memory. Well, they did think they had some memory problems, but that wasn't all that these individuals were reporting. And it wasn't what was bothering them the most, to be honest. Along with their short-term memory problems, they were reporting this difficulty with concentration, this inability to multitask. You know, I might be okay if I'm just talking to one other person, but you bring a third into the room, oh my gosh, I completely lose focus and have no idea what's going on. And these are people that are used to being in board meetings, or uh, I have a lawyer who's standing up in front of a judge and, and trying, to, and trying to, to do their job when they're having all of these issues with concentration and attention and multitasking, and it's really impairing them. These are some of the classic patient stories that we would see, that we'd see in clinic. Um, you know, and the, the wife, one of my very first patients who really inspired me to take a, a closer look at this, you know, she came in in tears when I asked her how she was doing. She'd been one in the hospital that actually had a fairly dense hemiparesis. And when she came to me in clinic, I thought she looked great, but she was miserable because all she wanted to do was go out to dinner with her husband and she couldn't have a conversation with he and his friends because she'd get lost and it was embarrassing to her. So she hadn't left the house in two months. Right? Or that attorney I started to tell you about who, smart guy, clearly well-educated, great at his job, and he was missing, he'd be just slow enough that he'd miss something the judge had said or he wasn't putting it together. Do you want him to defend you in a legal case? Right? Can't do his job anymore. And the important thing about all these individuals is that on basic neuro screening, when I do my screening exam, they all looked normal. Even when you say, oh, can you tell me the days of the week forward and backwards? If you give them enough time, it was fine, right? But they weren't normal. They were having problems. And all of these individuals didn't have strokes that look like this. They were lucky and they were lucky. They had strokes that look like this. So what's going on, right? Why is this happening? So what we started to look at this a little bit more was our, our recovery study for minor stroke. And we enrolled 80 patients with minor stroke and we, dis, we uh, defined minor stroke as an NIH stroke scale on admission of less than 10 or 10 or less and no large vessels. So I showed you that large vessel that you go in and, and, and uh, pull the clot out for thrombectomy. They couldn't have a large vessel involved. It had to be a small one because we wanted to avoid getting big cortical lesions that, okay, that, no, no, no wonder they have cognitive decline, right? We wanted small lesions where they looked good and didn't have other deficits like weakness, aphasia, neglect, right? They also couldn't have untreated psychiatric disease. They could have post-stroke depression as long as we were treating it, but, but no other uh, untreated disease. Our population was uh, had a mean age of, of early 60s, so uh, a little bit on the younger side, um, and that they did not have evidence of uh, prior dementia, so it was not documented in their chart. We don't have baseline testing to confirm that, but, but no documentation anywhere of dementia. Um, we were able to collect a group of people of all different occupational classes, because that was absolutely something we were interested in knowing, this bit that or having this feeling that baseline was important uh, with a mean education of, of about 13.5 years. So just over um, high school into college. Uh, we looked at things like social support. So if they had people to help them at home at how they were doing before. So their pre-stroke modified Rankin, making sure it was low as they all were. Risk factors, things like that. And as I said, we recruited people with, that had an NIH stroke scale of 10 or less, but in reality, our average NIH stroke scale was 2.8. So very mild uh, uh, strokes, mild drift, right? A couple of points, but not major deficits. If you were walking down the street and saw them, you would think that they had fully recovered and looked really great. Uh, their discharges NIH stroke scales were even lower, low stroke volumes, right? Six cc's, tiny, tiny. Uh, 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 mix of hemispheres, right and left. Some with just most or many with just subcortical. A couple with some uh, with some cortical components as well. Uh, and then varying degrees of rehabilitation. And our goal was to really learn who was struggling, if the location and size of stroke. Uh, made a difference and other factors that made a difference in how people recovered after these small strokes from a cognitive standpoint. So let's start before we get to the cognition piece, uh, looking at their function, at their functional outcome. 
So Barthel indexes is out of 100 and it's how well you do your ADL. So you want to get 100. 100 is perfect. And you can see that, again, these individuals didn't have a whole lot of problems. On average, 97.7, right? Most of them were at 100 doing everything. That doesn't mean they didn't feel like they had issues and, and were struggling, but they could get everything done. Uh, they had low NI stroke scales. They had low modified Rankins, right? Just a one. And a one means I have some deficits, but it doesn't really affect. I know they're there, but but you know I'm, I'm get able to do things. But take a look at this: the self-reported stroke impact scale, right? So again, uh, we want them to be near a hundred. Look, these are individuals that look pretty good, right? They look almost normal, yet they're reporting fairly significant dips in the things that they're able to do with response to thinking, mood communication, right? Uh, and the other thing that I want to point out just to keep in mind for later is they also endorsed fatigue. And when I say fatigue, I don't mean I got done walking and I'm tired, my whole body is tired. They mean I was thinking or I was conversing and now I'm cognitively, I'm just wiped out. Uh, the facet is, um, is, is uh, recorded on a scale of zero to 52 and more points are good. Cancer patients score a 30. So these individuals that were coming back with minor strokes looking good were reporting almost the same level of cognitive fatigue as a cancer patient after they'd have a conversation with someone or try to use their brain. Right? So I told you, I promised you that, that, uh, that I'd talk to you about their cognition, and we worked with our neuropsychologists to come up with uh, a battery of tests to really look at the different cognitive domains and to really see where they were struggling. So our battery consisted of the MOCA, which is a, a good screen, right? A good place to start and report it a lot. So we wanted to make sure we included that. We included the Hopkins verbal learning test uh, for verbal memory, the, br uh, the brief visual spatial memory test for some spatial memory, uh, DCAF's um, executive function test, the groove pegboard to, to take a look at their motor, and then single digit modalities. And the nice thing about all these tests is that they can be normalized, right? So we have a T-score and we can really see how they're doing compared to a normal population. And what we could do is we could also create composite scores. So we created a composite score for each domain where we would average the patient's T-scores for the tests that were appropriate for each domain. And we'd come up with a score for them with a composite score for their verbal memory, spatial memory, motor, processing speed, executive function, and global by combining them all. So how did our patients do? Remember, very, very low NIH stroke scale scores looked pretty good. So at one month, their mean MOCA score was a 24.6. So remember, these are 62-year-old people on average that were fairly well-educated, more than, more than high school, uh, that came in with a 24. That's not normal, right? I told you 26 or above is normal. They're, they're definitely not normal, but, but really, you know, really below what I expected. There were 50% that scored less than 26, so any impairment, mild impairment, and about 6% had a less than 19. So minor stroke patients are scoring pretty severe impairment, and these individuals are relatively young and didn't have dementia to start with. Now let's look at their, at their composite T-scores. So when I put them together, right, their domains, and we see, remember, our magic number is 50. So a T-score of 50 is average, and in every domain, at one month, they're scoring below average, right? So in spatial memory, in verbal memory, uh, in processing speed, uh, and then they are improving over time. Um, now you could say, well, they're not that far from 50 in some of these domains, which is true. But remember, these are individuals with minor small strokes. And I have a hard time believing that this is just, oh, you know, maybe they just all fall below the 50th percentile. Right. Um, the other piece that tells us that that isn't their normal is their recovery. So what we did is we looked, um, we took their one month score and we compared it to the highest score. So their, their six or their 12 month score, wherever their peak was. And what we found was a big difference. Look, eight points uh, here, um, greater than 20 points here uh, from the one month score to their recovery score. Um, so they clearly were not at their baseline at one month. They had taken a dip. These individuals with these tiny little lesions 
were having cognitive deficits that then fortunately did start in many cases to recover. When we look at their um, kind of graphically to, to get a better sense of it, you can see, so from here, look at their one, the absolute change in their T-scores. So their one month to recovery scores, you can kind of see how people, uh, how people did over time. And they had significant improvement from their one month to recovery score in every domain. And uh, the biggest changes were seen really in the one to six month time period, with change still seen from six to 12, but it, it not being statistically significant. And probably the reason for that is this. And this is a very, very, very messy slide because there's 80 patients on it, but it's solely to give you the, the, the sense that, look, in the first one to six months, most people are on this upward trajectory, right? Most lines go like this. But look at what happens after that. The lines are all over the place. Some go up, some go down, some stay the same. And that's probably why this six month to 12 month is not statistically significant because some are up and some are down. And it also tells us that, boy, do I have a lot of work to do to figure out, well, if everybody's getting better here, what's happening the six to 12 months? Why are some people continuing to get better and others not? That's the next question and what we're looking at now. I'll tell you, anecdotally, the people that uh, oftentimes in the first six months, people are very dedicated to their rehab, right? It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like after New Year's when you have that new gym routine, right? You go to the gym every day, you're on it, you're trying to lose the weight, and then eventually it gets kind of old and your family stops nagging you, your trainer stops nagging you, and things start to peter off. And I've noticed that a lot of the people that go down are those who now we're back to sitting on the couch and not necessarily using their brain. That's one of my hypotheses for sure. There's more to it than that. But now we have to prove uh, that, that, that that's at least a component. But we're very interested in, again, how we can make people continue to go up as opposed to this variability that we see. What we have been able to look at so far, though, are associations with the degree that they recover, with what that absolute recovery score is. So how high are they able to go? And we found some interesting patterns, and they're actually different for the different domains. If we look at this motor domain as an example, so on this red is, uh, is patients, it, it, it's negatively associated. So for here, motor age, the, the uh, higher their age, the older they are, the worse their, their, worse their, their um, peak motor score is. That makes sense, I guess. Um, uh, the higher their NIH stroke scale is, the worse their motor score is. Okay. Um, what was interesting is, is that some of these other domains are, are important. Remember how we showed this baseline? So education and occupational status, the code. So those with a higher, um, with, with more uh, uh, professional degrees of occupation, those individuals tended to do better. Um, so interesting findings. What I wanted to do next is shift just a little bit and talk about the constellation of symptoms and what they may mean and how we figure out uh, um, what may be going on. So I told you that their constellation of symptoms in this group is a little bit different than what may have been reported before generally in, with post-stroke dementia. Uh, they're reporting things like poor concentration, inattention, impaired executive function, which I hear you're going to hear more about next week, which is great and is really important in, in being able to, uh, you know, to do all the things that we need to do, and slowed reaction time. I'm just slow. I feel foggy and like I'm moving through pea soup, right? That Those are the stories we're hearing. When you think about it, and, and I do a lot of localization with the residents, if, if I gave them that set of symptoms and I said, localize the lesion, that sounds a lot to me like a frontal lobe syndrome, right? Uh, um, except that I'm going to show you in a minute specifically, but I just told you that these individuals didn't all have frontal lobe strokes, right? They had strokes all over the place and many of them were small. So how do you get a frontal lobe syndrome without necessarily having a frontal lobe lesion, a tumor or stroke or something else. That's what we wanted to know. And we uh, coined the term just as a descriptive phase, post-stroke acute dis-executive syndrome. So again, these are individuals initially after their stroke who are having problems with executive function, looking like a frontal lobe syndrome, even though their lesions might not be there. So, how, so the rest of my talk today, I want to talk about how we understand that pathophysiology, because we have to do that if we're going to devise effective treatments, uh, and how we use MEG uh, to help us do that.
So our hypothesis was that if you take a lesion like this that's not in the frontal lobe, it must be disrupting the network to result in global dysfunction and to look like a frontal lobe syndrome. And that would make sense because, you know, unlike the teaching or the very simplistic teaching that I had when I first started out that one lobe of the brain did this, right? Uh, we know that in order to use your brain, in order to complete a task, you actually need most, if not all of your brain, right? And the information is traveling back and forth and back and forth uh, you know, incredibly quickly between these thalamocortical and corticocortical projections all the time in order for us to function. So our hypothesis is that if you lesion anywhere within this network and alter that, that that you might be able to, uh, to cause this and that, that may be what's going on and resulting in these symptoms. So how do we prove it? Or how do we at least show that we may be on the right track? And what we decided to do was partner with our uh, colleagues at the University of Maryland at College Park, uh, where they have a magnetoencephalography uh, machine. They have an MEG, which is um, very similar to, um, it's kind of similar to an MR and it's kind of similar to an EEG in that it's able to map brain activity in real time, just like EEG, so you can see the waves, um, but it does it by measuring the electrical field currents that are occurring naturally in the brain. And it allows us to put it on a brain and show what's happening in real time when people are doing tasks. So I'll give you an example. This, uh, this is not ours. This is an example just of an MEG of someone who's looking at a beam of light. And you can see this is in milliseconds. So it goes really, really fast. We've slowed it down. Look, the light came in, it's in the occipital lobe, but watch it now bouncing all around. It's bouncing from the occipital lobe. It's going deep. It's coming back out to association cortex. It's bouncing around the entire brain. If this is what's happening just by looking at a beam of light, oh my gosh, what's happening when you're trying to complete a task and match things or remember things or do other things? Uh, MEG is the perfect tool because it's so fast uh, and able to look at things down to the millisecond uh, with such good localization to really look at this. So what did we do? We designed a recovery study where we took 15 patients with minor stroke. So these were individuals that had an NIH stroke scale of eight or less. So again, remember, none of those big, large vessels with a good modified ranking to begin with. Um, and we compared them to 15 age similar controls. Uh, we uh, tested them uh, about that, that one to one and a half months after their infarct. Um, and they were, went, underwent an MEG at the same time. And then we brought them back at six months and we did it again. The task that we used was a visual comprehension task and it had several different parts and got harder as it went on. So it began with a task with a familiarization task where the patient would see an object and then they would see the name. And these were from the Boston naming test. And you guys remember that some of the trellis, we wanted to make sure everybody knew what a trellis was. So we wanted to familiarize them. We also wanted to see what the brain was doing during familiarization, but they'd see the trellis, they'd see the name, and they knew they had no excuse to not know for the, uh, with the uh, tasks that were to come that that was a trellis. We then moved into match mismatch where the patient would see an object and then they'd see the name and they had to choose with the button presses whether it matched or didn't match. And they had to do it as quickly but as accurately as they could. The next uh, level was pairs naming. They'd see two objects and then they'd see a name and they had to decide whether it was A or B. And that's probably actually a little bit easier than match mismatch because they just had to decide which one it was. Um, uh, but again, a different level. And the last one and probably one of the hardest was pairs association where they'd see the objects that we talked about, but rather than seeing a name, they'd see a three word description, all easy words, um, but they had to decide which description, which picture that matched with. So this is just an example of what they'd see. So this is pairs naming. So they have a bed and a beaver, right? They'd see the cross, they'd see beaver, and as quickly as they could, they had to push the button corresponding to B, okay. So before I show you the results, it's important that we uh, discuss a couple key concepts that we were looking at that would tell us whether our hypothesis was on the right track, that this is a network issue and that these little lesions were resulting in, in network disruption. And the first is that of an M170 response. So the M170, um, M stands for MEG and, the, um, and is similar to the EEG 170 response. And it's generated mainly in the temporal lobe and fusiform gyrus in response to uh, most predominantly faces, but object recognition. 
And there's a nice deflection, either up or down, depending on the polarity, right around 170 milliseconds, where you expect to see in response to a picture, uh, this nice deflection. You can see how sharp it is and then how it comes right back up. The next key concept is something called temporal dispersion. And as neurologists, we see this a lot when we think about peripheral neuropathies. Um, and when you have a, a nerve, information travels down that nerve and it travels down that nerve quickly. If you cut that nerve or partially cut that nerve, what happens is, is that rather than all the information coming together in phase like it's supposed to and giving this nice, huge, beautiful, crisp response, all of a sudden, it's, uh, the information isn't traveling at the same speed. Some's getting there quicker, some is getting there less quickly. And what it's resulting in is this more uh, uh, blunted, lower amplitude, kind of rolling hill rather than this nice peaked response. So if you have a, a, a disrupted connection, you have temporal dispersion. And we expected that we, similar to the peripheral nerve, if we lesion the brain and create a block, that we would see a similar pattern of temporal dispersion of our signals, like the M170 response. So our testable hypothesis was that if PSODs, right, was due to a thalamocortical disconnection, that we should be seeing this, this lower amplitude, rolling hill, temporal dispersed picture. Um, and that we would see it both for pictures and words, and we'd see it in areas that were important for visual recognition and matching. So visual cortex, fusiform gyrus, temporal lobe. So we wanted to look at those specific areas focusing in because they're important in picture recognition. And our results, if you want to take a, a closer look, are were just published a, a couple of weeks ago in, in PNAS, uh, out for all to see. Um, but what we did is uh, we uh, were able, <laughs> with COVID, to recruit nine stroke patients instead of our, our intended 15 and eight controls. Um, so uh, a little bit over half. Unfortunately, we got disrupted and had to uh, cease um, clinical research because of the pandemic for safety. But uh, this population um, was very similar in age. So they were all in their upper 50s, a little bit younger than the population I talked to you about earlier. Um, again, similar, um, the control group had a little bit higher level of education, but they were both uh, greater, than, uh, greater than high school. Um, nobody had any dementia, like I said. Um, and the other difference between the two groups was their comorbidity index. And this was only because the stroke patients had had a stroke. But remember, these were individuals with a very low NIH stroke scale score who looked really good, uh, who didn't have aphasia, didn't have hemiparesis, looked pretty normal, despite the problems they were having with cognition. And these are examples of their strokes. Actually, these are their strokes. So you can see they're on both sides, the right and the left. They're very small. Um, they tend to be in areas, um, many of them are subcortical, that are not notorious for causing cognitive problems. A couple of them maybe hit the thalamus a little bit, but in general, um, uh, not necessarily areas that you'd say, oh, clearly they're going to have a cognitive issue. So let's see how they did behaviorally. Um, so again, I want to point out, so at the one month when we brought them back the first time uh, after their stroke, the controls had almost a perfect MOCA, averaged 29.5 out of 30, and those stroke patients with these low NIH stroke scale scores, the, the average was 0.7, so they barely got any points at all, were doing pretty well on, our, on the brief screen, uh, had a 26, so not normal, and several points below controls, right? Um, what was also uh, really interesting is, is, uh, is their reaction time. So they said they were slow and they were right. So uh, in many cases it reached statistical significance, but what you'll notice is, is that on every task, when you look at the difference between controls and stroke patients for the time to their response, the stroke patients are nearly doubled what the controls were. And you can say, well, these times aren't bad, they're still awfully fast, but think about the things that we do on a millisecond level the things we need to be able to do to shift attention, to multitask, to make sure that we're getting our kids ready for school and all these other things, completing our jobs, talking to 17 people, right? Uh, these minor differences, this is double difference is clinically significant. And that's what they were noticing and it was impairing them. Furthermore, uh, they missed more. So remember I told you they had to do it as quickly as they could, but as accurately as they could when they're matching things. And rather than making, you know, the controls, when your sacrifice uh, accuracy for speed made a couple of errors, but the strokes on average tripled the number of errors. 
and they did it and it took more time, right? So they're not as accurate and they're taking longer to do uh, the same task. But now let's see what the MEGs looked like. All right, let's see if it meets our, if it uh, matches our hypothesis. So I told you that we were gonna look at three uh, territories at the occipital lobe, at the fusiform gyrus and at the temporal lobe. And we looked at the early visual response. So what we see coming in in the visual, um, in visual cortex to begin with, at that M170 response that I told you is really important in fusiform gyrus for, for looking at objects, particularly faces. And then we looked at this M400 response that's more important for processing later on in, uh, in the temporal lobe. And what you see, controls are in black and patients are in blue, is that the controls get these nice peaks in these areas that we would expect. See, nice peak here, nice peak there. There's some variability. Nice peak here. Look at the strokes. So they're lower amplitude. They're kind of this rolling, rolling hill, right? What we expected to see if there's evidence of temporal dispersion. When we look across the brain, so if we average all of their responses across the brain, we see something similar. We see that the controls had this nice big response uh, when they looked at words or when they looked at images. Um, and, the, and the stroke patients just had this lower amplitude, more of a rolling hill kind of pattern. This was the one month. So remember I told you that nine patients and eight controls uh, were, were uh, underwent testing and were imaged at one month. And then six were able from each group to come back at the six month time point. Um, which had some issues with our sample size. And, and, um, and, but what we noticed was there was a trend for the curves being more similar, especially if you look at the group. So this is this six and six at the one month visit. Look at how far apart these are and look at how they're getting closer together. And the same thing here, look at how far apart these are and moving closer. We're in the process now, uh, we've opened back up uh, now that the numbers from COVID are finally starting to improve and we're going to be testing them again now that they're greater than 12 months out to see if these curves have now come together even more because I'll tell you and I, I, I didn't show you but their results at six months were better. They weren't, they were still slower, they still made more errors, but less so. They were clinically improving and they felt a lot better. So it will be nice to see how they look at a year now when I assume most of them will be even better and we'll see what their curves look like. The other thing that was really interesting that we took a look at was, uh, um, was what happened and what the different uh, morphologies of activation looked like. And what we found is that, remember how I told you that tasks varied in their degree of difficulty? Well, control responses were also able to vary uh, in response to how difficult the task was. Well, the stroke responses really stayed for the most part right around this zero range. Maybe they had an initial deflection, but then were very flat. So what, what that told us was, is that while controls could modulate their activity based on difficulty of tasks, stroke patients were providing the same amount of activation and the same amount of effort regardless of whether a task was easy or a task was hard. Uh, so could I convince you then that that's kind of like your brain in overdrive all the time and running a marathon all the time, never getting a break? No wonder they're cognitively fatigued if they're unable to modulate. So in summary, what did the MEGs show? So it showed that the stroke responses were lower amplitude and they were temporally dispersed and that there tended to be amplified uh, uh, for those areas that required higher degrees of processing um, and that they were unable to modulate activities based on task difficulty. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, well, it, it, it's not inconsistent with our hypothesis that, th that this disruption uh, of the network could be what's resulting in, uh, in cognitive deficits, right? And one of the ways to think about that is by thinking about the things you need for attention. So the default mode network, for example, that you need uh, interaction between all of these different areas to, uh, um, uh, to be able to, uh, to provide attention. So how else can we look at that? If, the, if we have the suggestion on MEG during task that, uh, that there may be network disruption, can we look at these at, at the default mode network and at other networks using connectivity analysis to really determine whether this is the case? And the answer is yes. And we've started to do so. Um, uh, we are uh, in the process of, of um, 
finalizing the pipeline and, and uh, get, uh, analyzing more patients. But right now we have three controls and three stroke patients that we've been able to look at. And what we find, it, find is that when we look at connectivity in the brains of controls versus stroke patients at rest, we actually find that controls have much stronger and consistent connections as opposed to the stroke patients that are much weaker and much more inconsistent. And you could say, well, Liz, you, you told me that the, you know, these patients have lesions, so of course their, their connections are going to be different. Just remember what those lesions looked like. They were tiny areas. I wouldn't have expected to see the tremendous impact on the connectivity for a single small lesion somewhere, right? So this is kind of out of proportion to what I was expecting to see based on the size and location of these different lesions. Much more work is needed to be done, and we're actually working on partnering with some of our colleagues in Spain uh, to, uh, to do more and to look at how that even might uh, be different than those individuals with Alzheimer's or with, uh, with um, vascular dementia and, and, uh, and versus those with just post-stroke. So what does this tell us? You know, I'm very interested in understanding the underlying pathophysiology. I think it's really important, but I'm also really interested in treating my patients, right? And figuring out how we can take this and apply it to, to design treatments that may be effective. Well, right now, what are we doing? Well, to varying degrees, we're doing focused rehabilitation. Some programs are really good at, at, you know, at focusing on the fact that these are high functioning folks that look pretty good, but they're having these problems. Other rehabilitation programs really aren't, and patients are frustrated. They say, I can do all the things they're asking me to do. I need to do things I can't do. So the, the focused rehabilitation uh, that really is working on getting them back to their jobs is not universally uh, present, which is, which is a problem. And oftentimes what I tell them is, it's kind of like choose your own adventure. Find the things you're having trouble doing at home and do them and work on getting better which at least then gives them that goal to work on. But clearly we can do better and, and, and it isn't ideal. The question is, is you know, whether things like stimulants or other neurotransmitters may be effective in helping with this connectivity. Uh, we've looked at it chronically in aphasia, probably the, the, the most, and the results have been mixed, but, but maybe there's a role. My concern is you know, putting a, a patient that's post-stroke on, uh, on a stimulant may have blood pressure effects or other effects. So I really have to be convinced that there's going to be potential benefit and, and, and won't be potential harm before I think about doing something like that, but maybe something to think about. And then the other thing, and, and what I'm very excited about is, is mindfulness therapy. So there's been some really good uh, uh, results in chronic disease states to show that mindfulness therapy is able to improve focus and concentration and attention in individuals with, with chronic disease states like migraine uh, and others. And the question is, is might that be helpful in this population? And if it is, um, clinically, what's it doing to the MEG? Is it doing anything to the network? Uh, so we actually currently have funding to, uh, to start this trial. And we have a clinical trial that we're randomizing 40 minor stroke patients to either mindfulness therapy for eight weeks or a traditional stroke support group, right? They're getting support, they're getting their socialization. Uh, and then we're going to look at the differences both clinically uh, and behaviorally, as well as imaging to see if there's differences. And why might this work? Well, one of the other things that we found on MEG is that there appears to be abnormal activity, particularly in this gamma range, in the frontal lobes after stroke, regardless. So this person's stroke is way back here, but they have increased frontal lobe activity. Where did that come from? What does that mean? I have no idea. But I do know that mindfulness therapies exercises, if you will, for lack of a better term, the frontal lobe, and that maybe it can affect some of this, and maybe it's a place to start. And I'm very interested to see what it ends up doing to the connectivity and to the changes on MEG to see if we can make things better and make things better faster. We'll have to see. I told you I was gonna end today uh, by not only talking about stroke, but talking about how this may be useful on a, on a broader scale. And when you think about it, you know, neurologic disease, there's a lot of, of neurologic disorders that have small little lesions, right? So we just showed for the first time that a small lesion can result in global problems due to a cognitive, due to a, a, a network disruption. But multi, patients with multiple sclerosis, I often hear my colleagues say, will have very similar fatigue issues or issues with cognition, this feeling fuzzy, you know, not quite uh, impaired, but, but just not right. The question is, 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 the, same, uh, is the same thing happening? Uh, is it happening in Parkinson's disease? 
with the amyloid plaques that are present in Alzheimer's or the different little lesions that, that are involved in vascular dementia, is it happening in dementia? Uh, these are all questions that I'm very interested in looking at and, and wonder if it may be a link and, and it may give us some additional targets to, uh, uh, to look at. So in summary, um, post cognitive dysfunction, I don't believe is just one syndrome, right? Um, uh, some people uh, go downhill and continue to, to decline. Others go down and, and make a miraculous recovery and trying to figure out who's going to, to be on which path and, and if it's modifiable is really important. Uh, PSODs, uh, for lack of, you know, I, it's easier to call it PSODs than to, than to try to explain exactly what it is. So I, so I like to refer to it as PSODs, is as often a transient phenomenon that we see with many of our individuals with minor stroke. So we talk about it when they come to see us in clinic because they feel like they're crazy, like they should be perfect because they otherwise feel good. Uh, and this may be modifiable. And it affects people with a huge potential to recover, right? These are individuals who shouldn't be quitting their job as lawyers. We need to get them back to where they, where they used to be. They have a huge potential. Um, so we need to do uh, a better job at, at, at understanding what's going on and then targeting that with therapy. Network dysfunction may be the key, and it may help us to understand uh, the, the, um, the cause of early cognitive deficits. And then we may be able to generalize it to other disease states. I just wanted to end by saying thank you to, to my lab and all of my collaborators. Um, I have several uh, um, uh, people in my lab, past and present, who've done a lot of work both for this study and for other studies. We've had a lot of fun. Uh, I want to uh, say thank you to the basic clinic where all of our patients are seen and cared for and followed longitudinally, as well as my collaborators at uh, both in psychology at the NIH and Hopkins, uh, as well as at NYU and at Maryland, because it really is a team effort uh, in order to get all of this work done. And with that, I think I will uh, open it up for questions. Thank you so much. How did I do? Not too bad. Okay. Oh, you did great. <laughs> I meant time-wise. I, yeah, yeah. I wasn't fishing for a compliment, I, but thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, Elizabeth. We have uh, we already have a few questions uh, online, Perfect. so I'll I'll get going right away. Uh, first question from Julius Fridrikson. Um, in your longitudinal study, did you assess the rate of depression and did you see if SSRIs had any effect on outcome? That's a great question. Uh, so we take post stroke depression very seriously um, and, uh, and I treat it very aggressively. We did adjust for depression and our results were still uh, were, were independent of depression. I will tell you though, it's interesting uh, since you brought it up, I actually am very concerned, um, uh, at least at our institution, the pendulums swung a little bit on whether or not patients are, are put on uh, SSRIs post-stroke. You know, when FLAME, the FLAME trial came out and said, hey, maybe being on an SSRI helps with motor recovery, a lot of people went on uh, SSRIs uh, to help with that. Uh, in more recent times, there's been some concern that, that maybe the, the results aren't as robust as we thought, and maybe there's more side effects. So I've watched actually the pendulum swing the other way and not as many patients be put on. And I'll tell you, in my clinic, the rates of post-stroke depression have skyrocketed. So I'm trying to now bring that pendulum back to the middle um, and, and really uh, watch for it in the hospital as well as in the outpatient setting and treat it aggressively because it makes a huge difference. Um, but, but yes, to answer your question, we we did adjust for that and, and it didn't affect our results. Independently, we still found that there was um, uh, that there were cognitive issues. Thank you. And then we have a question from um, Melissa Stockbridge, who I think is right there with you um, in Baltimore. Have you been able to look at all into the effects of therapy access? I'm thinking here of things like therapy caps playing a role in different long-term outcomes. And perhaps I can append the question that I had that is, I think is very related. Um, whether you can say a little bit more about your hypotheses on the origins of the negative associations you saw with recovery for a race, so for, for uh, black people and handedness for right-handed people. Um, sure, so, um, so I'll start with the, so it's, um, it's been really hard to get at uh, um, the, to get at the degree that uh, that rehab caps have played a role, uh, because rehab seems so variable. Even getting at the uh, you know, if somebody said our initial questionnaire was you know, have you 
are, what are you doing now? Are you doing home, outpatient, inpatient, you know, physical therapy, et cetera, or none? Uh, um, we, we really do, to answer your question, need to get much more granular. Uh, and in order for uh, me to satisfy and, and really be able to look in uh, to the hypothesis that that the amount of rehab or that it's stopping is, is going to play a difference. And we just don't have that granularity of data. Uh, so I am actually currently designing the questionnaire to try to figure that out and to keep that record. We've, we've had trouble. It's interesting, you, you know, to try to get what, one of the other things that I'm looking at is the degree of, of how active they are at home, that's actually really hard to pull out for people. You know, it, it's even when you ask them, you know, what do you do all day? Do you sit at home on the couch? Do you do your steps? Um, so whether that's gonna involve something, and I know that others are already looking at this, like, you know, some kind of wearable device where you can see how active they are or, or other things like that, um, you know, that's gonna probably be the best way and better and more optimal than something like a questionnaire because we just have struggled when we've just tried to ask the question and quantify it that way we just haven't i i just don't think we're getting at the question the right way um so i'm open to, to hearing your suggestions on that too because i absolutely think that it is an issue but it's it's hard to um it's hard to prove right now with the uh, granularity of the data that we have i want to go back to the slide that you asked me about with some of these, um, there we go. So it's, uh, the the association with race and with um, um, the domains is interesting, and I thought a lot about that. You know, there's certainly papers that have shown that in general, uh, MOCA scores are lower in African Americans, um, and that they do experience more decline. Um, uh, um, uh, when you look at them longitudinally, but I think even accounting for that, there's much more needs to be done. We have several people at Hopkins that are really interested in disparities, and um, and I'm very interested in in hearing their thoughts um, about some of the interplay that may be going on. We attempted to just uh, adjust for other factors that may be playing a role, so socioeconomic, education, access to care, and and still found in, um, that that race was a was a big factor. Um, so that needs to be fleshed out a, a, a bit more. But but the low hanging fruit, where these you know confounding variables did not appear to account for all of the difference. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question from Lisa Johnson. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. How do you think patient caregiver counseling or lack thereof influences their lower self-reported scores? I can imagine that while patients are testing as almost normal, they still recognize their shortcomings. So how do you think the role of counseling during all stages of recovery will change now that we are seeing the rate of mild strokes increasing? That's a really great question. And the problem with that, right, is that once you identify it and start to counsel, then you then you shift the balance. So once I, uh, what I've noticed and what I'm nervous about, uh, you know, continuing these studies in some way is that now that I talk about it, patients are really happy that that we're talking about it and that we're acknowledging it. But I don't know if then, when I ask them the next time to report, if that influences how likely they are to say that they're having these issues, right? As, opposed to before. So uh, so I now counsel all of my patients with minor stroke, this is happening. And it's funny, they're, um, I, I come out, they cry a lot because they feel like they're they're crazy. They, they feel like they shouldn't be feeling this way. Like there must be something wrong with them. Why are they so tired? Why can't they do these things? You know, they're, they're and half the time they're having issues with their spouse because their spouse thinks they're lazy or that they're not just not, you know, motivated enough or not doing enough. Uh, when in reality, they're having some of these issues. So uh, um, there was a day that I came out of clinic that every single patient I had cried just because they were so overwhelmed by the fact that this was real and that they weren't, you know, it wasn't all in their head. Um, but how that's then affecting the next set of questionnaires that we do in the patient reporting, uh, I think that is, an, it, um, it certainly makes it different. I would argue that maybe that it's richer now and they're actually reporting how they're feeling, um, but it will be different than those patients that I never talked to before. Um, or that first month where we, we never had that conversation yet because they did it before they came into clinic. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Brenda Rapp. Uh, perhaps you said this and I missed it. Any relationship between the symptoms and the meds that patients may be taking and then discontinuing, for example? That's a great question. Hi, Brenda. How are you? Um, so, uh, what, uh, we haven't been able to go uh, that the only uh, medication that we've been able to look at is SSRIs. Um, uh, 
and there doesn't seem to be um, any any um, association with that. But again, most of those patients are on it for depression. Um, uh, we have not uh, done a systematic review of the rest of their medications with respect to this, although the results are fairly consistent across the board and none of these patients had underlying psychiatric disease. So, um, uh, so those medications would be out. Most of them are on things like blood pressure control, um, you know, um, aspirin, Lipitor, those types of, of medications, but not on uh, anything uh, other than SSRIs for depression. Thank you. And we have a question from Kirana Tsapkini, who's also at Johns Hopkins. Does cognitive baseline performance and longitudinal changes correlate with perfusion and changes in perfusion? Great question. Uh, none of these patients have, uh, per so that was that they could not be enrolled in the study if they had uh, evidence of a larger vessel problem for exactly that reason. So RG trained us both very well, Karana. Uh, so I, I know that in the past people have argued that maybe people have more cognitive deficits because they had a larger area of hypoperfusion um, that is responsible for damage. And we specifically took that population out. So it's a, um, uh, by removing anybody with large vessel involvement um, to just look at those small strokes where there isn't a high degree of, of hypoperfusion that's affecting areas that could be responsible. That's a great question. Thank you. We're nearing the end, Elizabeth. So um, a question from uh, Katrina Frakopoulou. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I would like to ask how we can distinguish the influence of one executive function to another in the results of this study. And in general, when we study post-stroke dementia and other kinds of dementia or other neurologic diseases, even if we have different tasks for different executive functions, how can we be sure? And I would relate that also to, I, I had another question that was similar, but so to language, for example, how do you distinguish these cognitive um, uh, processing uh, deficits from language. From, from language. And that's why we tried to, yeah, so that is why I um, uh, remember that I had said we included initially people with up to an NIH of 10. Um, and that was so that we wouldn't, um, as a basic screen for enrollment, I didn't want to uh, not include somebody with a small lacuna that had resulted in quite a bit of weakness, but shouldn't have cognitive problems. But in reality, all of these individuals had much, much um, uh, lower NIHs, so they did not have, and, and aphasia was, a, uh, uh, was an exclusion factor, so we didn't want language to play a role, because I entirely agree with you that that would be really hard, right, to know, to be able to, to piece out. We'd be able to do it, but we'd need a, a much uh, larger group of people, and what I really wanted was people that didn't have evidence of aphasia or neglect or other um, uh, cortical uh, processing problems that, that would then overshadow the rest of this and this syndrome that we were seeing. And that's why we, we have that as the exclusion criteria. Now, I am not saying that individuals with aphasia or neglect don't have these problems. The problem is, is it's messier. And, um, and the problem is, is that those issues often overshadow these. So I think the reason we're seeing this now is because you know, when somebody has a is in bed with an aphasia and hemiparesis, they're not complaining that they feel fuzzy, right? They, what's, what they're talking about is the fact they can't speak um, or that they can't move. But once you take those deficits away, now what they're now they're seeing this and, and it, it may not be as much of an impact as the aphasia or the hemiparesis, but this is now what's bothersome to them. So I think those individuals with greater uh, severity strokes have this, it's just overshadowed by their other deficits. And what I attempted to do was remove that um, so that we could just see this, uh, what's underlying. Yeah, on the reverse side of that, it is, a, it is an issue for, for our field in language and aphasia, almost the other way around, yeah. right? So yep. our challenge is to, to, to determine to what extent the, the language deficit is in fact independent of uh, cognitive deficits. And your results appear to suggest or uh, show that even people with mild uh, or minor strokes do already have cognitive deficits. Yeah. So that makes it harder for us, you might say, to, to make the claim that language really is a separate module that can be- I see. Dependent. Yes, I agree entirely with you. Um, on the question, I'm not sure if you went into the, the separation of different executive functions from one another. Oh, I didn't. I, I, I didn't so much. Um, can you tell me a little bit more what you mean about that? 
So I, all I can do is, is repeat the question. So I would like to ask how we can distinguish the influence of one executive function from another in the results of this study and in general when we study post-stroke dementia. I wonder if you mean like attention versus um, versus processing speed versus uh, that yeah. component. Um, uh, we, um, we are we are able based on the battery that we have to look at some of those so not with the way that I did it with um, with making composite scores, but we can actually look at some of their. Um, you know how they did in the certain patterns um, you know on symbol the digit modalities versus um, you know um, some of the mocha screen and so i'm able to do that, but not based on the on the big analysis of the big group where i made the composite scores. Thank you and then finally. Uh, Jean Neil Strangers uh, uh, asked if you can uh, address also uh, one factor I brought up earlier about right handedness. How, why do you think that is affecting um, uh, treatment response negatively or recovery negatively? You know, that's a good question. I, um, I think it's it, it, that that's probably to be on. I think that we had one left handed person, and I think that it just that that's probably a. Um, uh, um, uh, it probably shouldn't have been included uh, in in the um, display of these results because I think it's it's not that oh we have all of these people and and we've shown that right handedness is 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 the pro is negatively associated. I think it's that uh, uh, we didn't have enough uh, to have a nice representation of groups and that's just the way it fell out. So I wouldn't make too much of that. Um, I probably should have taken it out for this presentation. That's a good catch and a good point. I wouldn't make anything of that yes, uh, yet. Most of our people are right-handed. There are a couple of left-handed and maybe they just did better in, in, uh, in this, but we'll certainly continue to collect that group uh, and take a look at them once I have more, but I don't think I have enough to actually say right now. On behalf of fellow right-handers, thank you. No problem. <laughs> I think that brings us to the end uh, of today's CSTAR talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsh. Uh, thank you to the audience for your questions and for attending. Um, I know that you will be available for our students as well after this for a little bit, so thank you for that. And we, we'll move to a different room, so we log out and log back in. But um, for the other, uh, the rest of the audience, I hope to see you again in two weeks' time, and we'll be listening to uh, Dr. Laura Murray. Bye-bye. Thank you.